great to be here tonight, guys and girls. Thanks for coming along. Um, as mentioned, my name is Dean McAvoy, and I'm currently working on my third um, technology startup. My first was an online booking system called Booking Angel, which was a booking system for restaurants. My second was Australia's first group buying site, uh, Spreets, which we sold to Yahoo for $40 million. And my third, as mentioned, is Australia's, uh, the world's first uh, crowdfunding and, and fund, crowdfunding site for bars and restaurants. Um, the first thing to think about, the first thing I want to tell you all today, is that there, there are no rules or lessons or books you can read about uh, growing a successful startup. There's no courses you can take. In fact, the only way to really learn about startups is to listen to other people's stories and the lessons they've learned. Because by very definition, a startup is something where you're solving a problem no one else has ever solved. So there's no roadmap or anything to do. So today is really just about me sharing some stories and some lessons I learned. So the first lesson I want to talk to you about is how chasing money actually fucked my business. So um, it sounds like a pretty surprising thing to do, but um, and surprisingly my story starts just a few hundred meters from where I currently am working um, at Centrelink in Darlinghurst. So um, it, it's back in 2004. Three, I had an idea for an online booking site, and I was like, how am I going to start this? So I started looking around the internet for ways to start a business. And there's a government program called the New Enterprise Incentive Scheme. But the catch for the New Enterprise Incentive Scheme is you have to be on the dole to qualify for it. They give you 250 bucks a week to work on your business. So I was like, cool, I'm going to chase this money because it will help me get started. I'll be able to do whatever I need to do to, to make, make shit happen. So sure enough, I'm down there at 8.30 in the morning, lining up out the front of uh, Centrelink with a few of my other friends, very keen to get in there and get some money as well. And, uh, and sure enough, got into the new enterprise incentive scheme, which actually is a great, a great um, course. But the problem with that is it teaches you how to grow a small business. And I didn't want to grow a small business. I wanted to grow a large, global internet company. And I was like, I was trying to work out the best way to kind of go about doing this. Um, so I took the money for a year, but it really only taught me about growing a small business. So then I, look, I kept looking around for money, and government money is, you know, often a good source. And there was a program called the Comet Grant, which commercialising emerging technologies. So I went and met with an advisor, and they said, right, you've got a good business idea, but you need patents. We don't, we don't give you any money unless you've got patents. I'm like, cool, patents, money. All right, I'll go get some patents. So sure enough, went and spent some money getting patents, wasted shitloads of time and money, and, and absolutely wasted time uh, registering patents. But I got my money off Comet, and it helped me grow my business. But Again, it, it just it wasted a lot of my time and it, it put me in a, in a frame that I didn't need to be in. Um, the, the next phase was going and pitching investors. And in fact, I went so far as pitching investors on television. Um, I, was, I pitched Booking Angel on the Australian version of Dragons then. I couldn't find a, a picture of the Australian Dragons because the show actually got axed before my episode went to air. Um, <laughs> so I had, I had absolutely no responsibility in the, in the downfall of the ratings. But... Um, the, I, I mean, again, I just wasted a lot of time and effort and energy pitching those guys. But then I kept pitching investors here in Australia. And the thing about Australian investors is they haven't really invested in technology companies before. They've invested in mining companies and ASX companies. So they're used to looking at graphs on their comsec and that kind of thing to make investment decisions. And they put me through a similar rigour with Booking Angel where we're basically... Um, uh, you know, I was going out doing kind of five-year forecasts of my business plan and, and doing a discounted cash flow back to work out evaluation. And, um, it was absolute, again, <coughs> a complete sort of waste of time for a startup company. Um, so I didn't have any luck pitching Australian investors. So sure enough, people are raising money in Silicon Valley. Lots of money over in Silicon Valley. I'm going to chase the money over to Silicon Valley. So I was sort of standing over, the, um, you know, pitching everyone in Silicon Valley. I met some of the best investors in the world who invested in some of the smartest companies that have ever existed. And I was pitching them my extremely protected, well-patented um, uh, kind of uh, business with an amazing five-year forecast that discounted the cash flow back to make my valuation $5 million. And Americans are too polite to laugh at you, so um, they actually all took meetings with me. And, and, um, and the thing about Americans is they never say no. Um, they, just, they just say, oh, it's great what you're doing, come back to me when you've got some more customers. Um, so it's another lesson to learn, you know, everything but yes is a no. But um, the problem with when I was over in Silicon Valley is I was constantly selling other people on my business. I wasn't listening to the feedback that these amazingly intelligent uh, people who'd started businesses were giving me. And so, uh, you know, I was sitting down talking to them and it was only in, in, a, in a similar pitch, I was pitching the founder of Eventbrite, um, a guy called Kevin Hartz. And I was talking to him, and for some reason, I actually started to listen to what he said. And he was asking me, why am I doing what I was doing, you know? You know, what's stopping your business from being successful? 
And I really started to look at my business through the eyes of an investor. And that was the first time I could really look and, and realize that my, my business was shit. Um, I'd, been, I'd been working on a business that was small, in a small market. I didn't have a team around me. And so it's an important process. And I, and I started to think about what is the process that an investor goes through when they look at a business. Um, and this is important for when you're thinking about your company because um, if you're not this, um, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that your business may not be this, but um, this is the way an investor will look at it. Um, so if you can try and engineer your business to be this, it'll make life easier. First thing is your team. How good are you? You know, are you, are you an A-class team? And by definition, team, that's more than one person. So um, single people don't get invested. Um, you know, it happens rarely, but it just doesn't happen very much. Um, is it an attractive market? Is it a big market that's addressable? Do you understand the problems in it? Are you actually solving a problem in that market too? It's not just, I've got a better better version or a way of um, you know, building a mousetrap is the, is the cliche. That, um, you know, you've got to be solving a problem rather than actually just doing a slightly a little bit better version of a product, um, particularly in this early stage technology world. And then, this is the part I think is most important, is the, is the authentic connection you have with that problem. If you've spent your entire life in financial services and you're pitching me a startup about hospitality or about, you know, ballerinas, you're like, well, how the hell do you know about this? What, do you know the problem? Why do you care about the problem? Um, you know, why are you doing this? And if you don't have an authentic connection, you're not going to know how to talk to other people in the industry, how to sell people in the industry, you're not going to have a network. So for me, it's actually one of the most important things when I talk to a founder. You know, why, they, why do they care about the business they're doing and how do they know more about it than most people? Um, if you don't fit that mold, there are still circumstances where an investor might be interested in you. So they just might need some more validation. So you, you might need to have more customers, more products. You might need to build it out more to prove to them that you've actually got product market fit. Um, and similarly, if, if you're not in an attractive market, it makes life difficult, but um, uh, you know, um, it's not impossible. The other question that these people ask is like, should I build my startup here or in the US? You know, and everyone thinks, oh, Silicon Valley's awesome, and it is. Like, I lived over there, I learned a lot, and just by being around people who are really smart, you, you elevate your game. But Australia is a hell of a lot better than what it was back in 2004 when I was lining up outside Darlinghurst with uh, with my itchy friends down um, uh, down there. But they um, <laughs> they uh, there's great things now, like you know, Muru and there's great education programs, there's start makers other kind of great um, great things for entrepreneurs to learn about how to start a startup and make it successful. Um, the most important thing, I mean, there is a lot of discussion about incentives that other governments are giving, but I'm sick of hearing excuses about that. Just because we're not as good as Singapore, because they give more money to startups, or we're not as good as Israel because the incubators don't do this. You know, the number one thing about being successful in startups is stop making excuses, make it happen. There's no excuses, just make it happen no matter what. And that's true of um, you know, the excuses around the government doesn't give us enough help and you know, um, employee share options. Sure, they're a pain in the ass and things and things, but we just get on with it. Um, the, other, the other thing as well is like, it's not Australia or the rest of the world. You have to start your <coughs> company here with a global view. Now, Australia's in an unfortunate situation where we're just big enough where you can start a company that can kind of make money in Australia. Um, but it's a bad idea. You should really, even though I did it, you should, you should really like aim for a global market on day one. So you've really got to be starting a startup with a view of being the best in the world and understanding a problem that, that everyone in the world has. And, and you should think about how you market your customers and get customers that way. It's just a much bigger opportunity and a better way to be. The one thing I would say about the you know, Australian government, if we're going to talk politics for a little bit, is that it seems like overseas entrepreneurs are embraced and held up there. You know, they're met with the people at the highest level um, whereas I think entrepreneurs here, there's still a bit of a weird stigma to it. And I was trying to think about why this was the other day. When Australians talk about an entrepreneur, I still think, those of you who are a little older in the room will recognise this person, still think of entrepreneurs <laughs> like this guy. And unfortunately, who, who, who doesn't know who this guy is? The young people, right? Um, the, uh, this is Christopher Skates. So he was an entrepreneur, very successful, built the Mirage Resorts uh, back in the 80s. Um, he owned Channel 7, he had a whole heap of other interests, hugely successful entrepreneur. Um, then his business started to tank and he escaped over to um, uh, Mallorca with, uh, with his wife and you know, dodged the Australian Securities Commission for years and they never caught him and he stole, or he took heaps of money evidently overseas. So I think when the Australian government thinks about entrepreneurs, I still think they think about this guy 
so that actually your f their first thought is not that these guys are going to go and change our economy and create thousands of jobs. It's like they're probably going to try and steal money off people. So um, I still think that that, that, that that mindset does carry through, which is unfortunate. And it's, it's probably why they, they let opportunities like these guys, you know, move overseas. Um, the two founders of Atlassian, you know, um, I think it's an absolute shame that they allowed their company to be domiciled over in the, over in um, the UK. It's not their fault. Like, they had to do it. It just didn't make sense to keep it here. But the fact that no one in government put their hand up and said, let's do something to try and keep Australia's probably most successful technology company domiciled here. And the, the only difference for me, they've still got employees here and everything's great, but just means that when they float on the NASDAQ for billions of dollars, the tax paid will go to the UK, not here, which is just bloody ridiculous, but that's my little rant over. Um, the other thing as well is that it's not about um, Aussie investors versus US investors. Like, everyone thinks, you know, um, US investors are much better. The only reason US investors are much better is because they've all grown and sold large internet companies. So you're getting experience of technology investors behind. Now, there's... That used to be the case in Australia, but there's a growing network of Aussies who've made money over in the US and are coming back here to invest. So funds like Blackbird Ventures and um, there's guys down in, uh, in Melbourne, Square Peg. You know, they're all successful entrepreneurs who um, invest in technology companies and you get the benefits, the same benefits that you would from a US investor. Um, for any investors in the room, if you're here, um, the, there's only three types of investors. There's smart investors, big investors, um, and... Uh, I say, and fast, and fast investors. And more likely in Australia, there's not many investors who made success and, and had, uh, you know, the smart investors. There's, there's not many big ones either. So chances are, if you're an angel investor, you need to be fast. Because if you're not fast, you miss out on the good deals. To give you an idea, when we raised money for Spritz, um, you know, I pitched at an angel dinner. We had a few people interested in Australia. Um, I got an intro to a guy in Europe. He made a phone call. I flew over to Europe that Saturday. He gave me a term sheet about lunchtime. We had the bank money in the bank two weeks later. So the speed at which they worked was, you know, lightning fast. And if they were fast, big and smart, so um, you know, it was uh, it was a good thing. The other thing that, that entrepreneurs waste way too much time thinking about is valuation, and it's because you hold it as a badge of what you're worth, um, which is kind of it's kind of stupid when you when you understand the deep long game you're playing. All you need to know as an entrepreneur when you're raising money, raise enough money. So you can execute and do what you need to do for the next 12 to 18 months. How many people do you need? What resources do you need? Work it out. Put a number on it. No matter what that number is, you're going to have to give up between 10 and 30% of your company for that amount of money. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but like, what if I need 500 grand? What if I need a million dollars? What if I need 200 grand? What if I need 100 grand? It doesn't matter what you're raising. You give up 10% or 30%. Um, and the difference between 10 is I've done it before. I've got runs on the board. Um, experienced and um, the 30% is I've probably got a few less runs on the board, um, uh, not quite as many customers or I may not have as well built out prototype. <coughs> the most important thing that you can remember is that when you're creating a business, you need to create something that's bigger than you. Um, who in the room here would, um, if, if, you're, if I came and pitched you and said, I want you to come and work at my startup so that I can spend more time with my kids, <laughs> who would be pumped to join me? No? Not many? What, so, and what about when you went to employ other people? So, you, you've got to think of, when you articulate your business, how can it do something for other people? How can it make their lives better? And we thought about this intensively with um, my current startup, Icon Park. So, the way Icon Park works is we take concepts, anyone who has a dream to open a bar or restaurant, they pitch us on our platform, we select the top six that go up on our crowdfunding platform, and whoever gets the, the most pre-purchases from the public on their concept wins a real building down on Stanley Street to execute on their, um, their idea. And so, um, because we were creating something that was bigger than us, it was a movement, it was about enabling other people's dreams, not ours. We got all these people here to work for free over a whole you know, four days at the Taste of Sydney Festival, absolutely busting their gut. Actually, it was four days and then probably like four or five days preparation. So all of these people were working for free with a very small team. So this is the awesome team that made all that happen within, um, within the Icon Park family. And, um, uh, and you know, all these people came and, and, and were executing their dreams because we were enabling them to do something that was greater than us. It wasn't about them coming to work and do a business that's going to make me rich one day. That's not, any, that's not a compelling reason for anyone to do anything. We're doing something that's going to go out and try and change the world and try and you know, enable people with talent to get in 
get access to the capital that they never could get access to. And the results spoke for themselves. We raised almost $300,000 over 21 days, um, and we reached almost 1.3 million people on Facebook. Now, that was from a standing start with no marketing budget. We spent $17,000 on marketing um, over the whole time, and that included like video production and stuff like that. Um, so you can, and these guys were absolute um, <coughs> rock stars. You know, Matt Stone's got a, a, a show on Nat Geographic, and all these guys are very well, well respected industry people. The one thing, though, um, if, if you remember nothing else about what I've spoken about here, uh, I just want you to remember this one thing, and that's that's the most important. And that is just fuck chasing money, go and create a movement. So. Um, <coughs> <laughs>